Hello, this is Miss Madley, and I will be reading Matilda by Roald Dahl, illustrated by Quentin Blake. Now this is a bit of a long book, so I'll be reading it in intervals of about 20 minutes. Matilda by Roald Dahl, illustrated by Quentin Blake. Quentin Blake is the person who makes these drawings that you see often in Roald Dahl books, but you've probably seen in this kind of drawing in other books too. For Michael and Lucy, here's the contents. Here are all the chapters. I'm hoping to get through two chapters in 20 minutes, maybe three. We shall see. The Reader of Books. It's a funny thing about mothers and fathers. Even when their own child is the most disgusting little blister you could ever imagine, they still think that he or she is wonderful. Some parents go further. They become so blinded by adoration, they manage to conceive themselves their children it has qualities of genius. Well, there's nothing very wrong with all this. It's the way of the world. It is only when the parents begin telling us about the brilliance of their own revolting offspring that we start shouting, bring us a basin. We're going to be sick. A basin is a, um, like a sink. So you're going to puke in the sink. But um, Roald Dahl is British, so he uses some different words than we do. School teachers suffer a good deal from having to listen to this sort of twaddle from proud parents. But they usually get their own back when the time comes to write the end of term reports. If I were a teacher, I would cook up some real scorchers for the children of doting parents. Your son, Maximilian, I would write, is a total washout. I hope you have a family business you can push him into when he leaves school because he sure as heck won't get a job anywhere else. Or, if I were feeling lyrical that day, I might write, It is a curious truth that grasshoppers have their hearing organs in the sides of the abdomen. Your daughter, Vanessa, judging by what she's learned this term, has no hearing organs at all. I might even delve deeper into natural history and say, the periodical cicada spends six hours as a grub underground and is no more than six days as a free creature of sunlight and air. Your son, Wilfred, has spent six years as a grub in this school, and we are still waiting for him to emerge from the chrysalis. A particularly poisonous little girl might sting me into saying, Fiona has the same glacial beauty as an iceberg, but unlike an iceberg, she's absolutely nothing below the surface. I think I might enjoy writing end-of-term reports for the stinkers in my class. But enough of that. We have to get on. Occasionally one comes across parents who like, who take the opposite line, we sh who show no interest at all in their children. And these, of course, are far worse than the doting ones. Mr. and Mrs. Wormwood were two such parents. They had a son called Michael and a daughter called Matilda. And the parents looked upon Matilda in particular as nothing more than a scab. A scab is something you have to put up with until the time comes when you can pick it off and flick it away. If you don't know, a scab is what you get when you get a cut and then it heals over and is kind of um, scratchy and itchy and yucky looking. That's a scab. Mr. and Miss Wormwood looked forward enormously to the time when they could pick their little daughter off and flick her away, preferably into the next country or even further than that. 
It is, a, it is bad enough when parents treat ordinary children as though they were scabs and bunions. Bunions are when you get uh, like a fungal infection on your toe. <laughs> were scabs and bunions, but it became somehow a lot worse when the child in question is extraordinarily, extraordinary. And by that I mean sensitive and brilliant. Matilda was both of these things, but above all, she was brilliant. Her mind was so nimble and she was so quick to learn that her ability should have been obvious even to the most half-witted of parents. But Mr. and Mrs. Wormwood were both so gormless and so wrapped up in their own silly little lives that they failed to notice anything unusual about their daughter. Gormless is another British word and I actually don't really know the definition of gormless but if you think of the word gormless what does it sound like to you? Can you guess what gormless means? Using this sentence but Mr. and Mrs. Wormwood were both so gormless and so wrapped up in their own silly little lives that they failed to notice anything unusual about their daughter. I'm sure it's not something good. To tell the truth, I doubt they would have noticed had she crawled into the house with a broken leg. Matilda's brother Michael was, perfectly nor was a perfectly normal boy, but the sister, as I said, was something to make your eyes pop. By the age of one and a half, her speech was perfect, and she knew as many words as most grown-ups. The parents, instead of applauding her, called her a no noisy chatterbox and told her sharply that small girls should be seen and not heard. By the time she was three, Matilda had taught herself to read by studying newspapers and magazines that lay around the house. At, age f at the age of four, she could read fast and well, and she naturally began hankering after books. The only book in the whole of this established household was something called Easy Cooking, belonging to her mother. And when she had read this from cover to cover and had learned all the recipes by heart, she decided she wanted something more interesting. Daddy, she said, do you think you could buy me a book? A book, he said. What do you want a flaming book for? To read, Daddy. What's wrong with the telly, for heaven's sakes? We've got a lovely telly with, 12, with a 12-inch screen, and now you come asking for a book? You're getting spoiled, my girl. In Britain, a television is called a telly. Nearly every weekday afternoon, Matilda was left alone in the house. Her brother, five years older than her, went to school. Her father went to work and her mother went out playing bingo in a town 88 miles away. Mrs. Wormwood was hooked on bingo and playing it five afternoons a week. On, on the afternoon of the day when her father had refused to buy her a book, Matilda set out all by herself to walk to the public library in the village. When she arrived, she introduced herself to the librarian, Miss Phelps. She asked if she might sit a while and read a book. Miss Phelps, slightly taken aback at the arrival of such a tiny girl, unaccompanied by a parent, nevertheless told her where she was uh, told her she was very welcome. Where are the children's books, please? Matilda asked. They're over there on the lower shelves, Miss Phelps told her. Would you like me to help you find a nice one with lots of pictures in it? No, thank you, Matilda said. I'm sure I can manage. From then on, every afternoon, as soon as her mother had left for bingo, Matilda would toddle down to the library. The walk took ten minutes, and this allowed her two glorious hours sitting quietly by herself in a cozy corner, devouring one book after another. When she had read every single children's book in the place, she started wandering around in search of something else. Miss Phelps, who had been watching her with fascination for the past few weeks, got up from her desk and went over to her. 
Can I help you, Matilda? She asked. I'm wondering what to read next, Matilda said. I finished all the children's books. You mean you've looked at the pictures? Yes, but I've read the book as well. Miss Phelps looked down at Matilda from her great height, and Matilda looked right back up at her. I thought some were very poor, Matilda said, but others were lovely. I liked the secret garden best of all. It was full of mystery. The mystery of the room behind the closed door and the mystery of the garden behind the big wall. Miss Phelps was stunned. Exactly how old are you, Matilda? She asked. Four years and three months, Matilda said. Miss Phelps was more stunned than ever, but she had a sense not to show it. What sort of book would you like to read next? She asked. Matilda said, I would like a really good one that grown-ups read. A famous one. I don't know any names. Miss Phelps looked along the shelves, taking her time. She didn't know what to bring out. How, she asked herself, does one choose a famous grown-up book for a four-year-old girl? Her first thought was to pick a young teenager's romance of the kind that is written for 15-year-old schoolgirls. But for some reason, she found herself instinctively walking past that particular shelf. Try this, she said at last. It's very famous and very good. If it's too long for you, just let me know, and I'll find something shorter and a bit easier. Great Expectations, Matilda Reed, by Charles Dickens. I'd love to try it. I must be mad, Miss Phelps told herself. But to Matilda, she said, of course, you may try it. Over the next few afternoons, Miss Phelps could hardly take her eyes from the small girl sitting for hours after, for hour after hour in the big armchair in the far end of the room with the book in her lap. It was necessary to rest it on the lap because it was too heavy for hold, her to hold up, which, which meant she had to sit leaning forward in order to read. And a strange sight it was, this tiny dark-haired person sitting there with her feet nowhere near touching the floor, totally absorbed in the wonderful adventures of Pip and old Miss Havisham and her cobwebbed house, and by the spell of magic that Dickens, the great storyteller, had woven with his words, the only movement from the reader was li the lifting of the hand every now and then to turn over the page. And Miss Phelps always felt, felt sad when the time came for her to cross the floor and say, It's ten to five, Matilda. During the first week of Matilda's visit, Miss Phelps had said to her, Does your mother walk you down here every day and then take you home? My mother goes to... Alice Burry's every afternoon to play bingo, Matilda had said. She doesn't know I come here. But that's surely not right, Miss Phelps said. I think you'd better ask her. I'd rather not, Matilda said. She doesn't encourage reading books, nor does my father. But what do they ex expect you to do every afternoon in an empty house? Just moot around and watch the telly. I see. She doesn't really care what I do, Matilda said a little sadly. Miss Phelps was concerned about the child's safety on the walk through the fairly busy village, High Street, and the crossing of the road, but she decided not to interfere. Uh, mooch around is uh, kind of lay around the house. Within weeks, Matilda had finished Great Expectations, which in, which in that edition contained 417, oh, sorry, 411 pages. I loved it, she said to Miss Phelps. Has Mr. Dickens writ, written any others? A great number, said the astonished Miss Phelps. Shall I choose you another? Uh, Charles Dickens is a very famous uh, English writer 
and hopefully when you get older, because his books are very long and very hard to read, if I do say so myself, um, hopefully you will be able to read them because they are very good. Over the next six months, under Miss Phelps's watchful and compassionate eye, Matilda read the following books. Nicholas Nickleby by Charles Dickens, Oliver Twist by Charles Dickens, Jane Eyre by Charlotte Bronte, Pride and, Pride and Prejudice by Jane Austen, Tess of the Dubervilles by Thomas Hardy, Gone to Earth by Mary Webb, Kim by Rudyard Kipling, The Invisible Man by H.G. Wells, The Old Man and the Sea by Ernest Hemingway, The Sound and the Fury by William Faulkner, The Grapes of Wrath by John Steinbeck, The Good uh, Companions by J.B. Priestley, Brighton Rock by Graham Greene, Animal Farm by George Orwell. Actually, so this big list of books is kind of, um, a lot of these books are uh, books that you're going to read in high school. And they're very, very famous books that she is reading. It was a formidable list, and by now Miss Phelps was filled with wonder and excitement. But it was probably a good thing that she did not allow herself to be completely carried away by it all. Almost anyone else witnessing the achievements of this small child would have tempted to make a great fuss and shout the news all over the village and beyond. But not Miss Phelps. She was someone who minded her own business and had long since discovered it was seldom worthwhile to interfere with other people's children. Mr. Hemingway says a lot of things I don't understand, Matilda said to her, especially about men and women, but I love it all the same. The way it tells it, I feel I am right there on the spot, watching it all happen. A fine writer will always make you feel that, Miss Phelps said, and don't worry about the bits you can't understand. Sit back and allow the words to wash around you like music. I will, I will. Did you know, Miss Phelps said, that public libraries like this allow you to borrow books and take them home? I didn't know that, Matilda said. Could I do it? Of course, Miss Phelps said. When you have chosen the book you want, bring it to me so I can make a note of it. And it's yours for two weeks. You can take more than one if you wish. From then on, Matilda would visit the library only once a week in order to take out new books and return the old ones. Her own small bedroom now became her reading room, and there she would sit and read most afternoons, often with a mug of hot chocolate beside her. She was not quite tall enough to reach things around the kitchen, but she kept a small box in the outhouse, which she brought in and stood on Oops, let me try that again. Box, a small box in the outhouse, which she brought in and stood on in order to get whatever she wanted. Mostly it was hot chocolate she made, warming the milk in a saucepan on the stove before mixing it. Occasionally, she made bovril or ovaltine. Ovaltine is a tea. I don't know what bovril is. It was pleasant to take a hot drink up to her room and have it beside her as she sat in her silent room reading in the empty house in the afternoons. The book transported her into new worlds and introduced her to amazing people who lived exciting lives. She went on olden day sailing ships with Joseph Conrad. She went to Africa with Ernest Hemingway and to India with Rudyard Kipling. She traveled all over the world while visiting in her little room in an English village. Next chapter, Mr. Wood, uh, Woodworm. Sorry, golly, hoo hoo hoo. Mr. Wormwood, the great car dealer. So I'll read the next chapter tomorrow. I hope you 
enjoyed the first chapter of Matilda. <laughs>